Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Consumerism is one of the main features of American culture. Americans are consumers of food, information, fashion, entertainment, automobiles. Uh, I, I think if I remember correctly, consumer spending accounts for almost 80% of our gross domestic product. Um, it's tremendous. And, and that's why the day after September 11th in uh, 2011, 2001, uh, the president actually went on the air and told everybody to go to the mall, go shopping, keep everything going so we can keep this country going by buying stuff. We are used to having choices about where we shop, what we buy. We pride ourselves when we find a good bargain, when we dicker down the salesman on the price of a new car or a TV. Um, to Lisa's embarrassment all the time, whenever we go garage sale shopping or rummage sales, as we called them in Wisconsin, I always feel like it's important to try to dicker on the price, you know, even on that 50 cent paperback or that $1 DVD, because it just doesn't feel right if you don't get a good deal. We're picky, we're choosy, and if we don't like our options, we take our business elsewhere. Unfortunately, we bring the same consumer mentality into our search for the perfect church, and Christians will openly and unapologetically talk about church shopping. Have you ever heard that phrase before? I'm shopping for a new church, kind of like a new pair of pants, and we want to find out if, if the fit is right if this congregation will meet our needs or, or feed us. And when we say feed us, we usually don't mean, if we're honest with ourselves, a church that teaches us a diet of good, firm, solid biblical truth, but a church that makes us feel good about ourselves. Maybe even at the expense of telling us the truth about ourselves from the scriptures. When we look for in a church, it varies by family and individual, but pretty much we kind of want a variety of programs and ministries for different ages and stages of life. Some people are looking for a church with a dynamic youth ministry, or singles ministry, or children's ministry, or older adults ministry. And, and those older adults ministries, some of them have, have, have really, really fun names, right? Like the High Timers, or the Golden Girls, all kinds of different names for those senior ministries. You know, we want to church it as a food bank and a homeless ministry, and mission trips so that we can plug in in a way to help others. And, and, and then where do you find the churches with the most programs? Well, the ones with the most people, right? Because more people, more money, more ministry. And so we might go looking for a mega church where it's actually very easy to fall through the cracks and just be kind of an anonymous person without a lot of relationship with other people. And then there's a pastor. With a pastor, we want somebody who is a good showman, someone who is a good performer, because the pastor needs to be intelligent and witty and sensitive and, and, and all at the same time. And then the music. I mean, the music really makes it for you, right? We want a rockin', radio-ready praise band or a pipe organ with so many ranks of pipes that it will just knock your socks off as soon as those bass pedals get pushed, right? And if this or that church does not offer exactly what you're looking for in the right combination, you can drive to any other number of churches to find the church that's the right fit. Now, this can be really overwhelming for pastors and other church leaders. And, you know, even though we're supposed to believe that all the churches are on the same team, that we're all batting for Jesus, and that we're all trying to help people go to heaven, this consumerism can actually lead churches and pastors to feel like we're in competition with each other. And we can try really hard to be all things to all people, while at the same time being faithful to the scriptures and to the Lord. But if you're trying to be all things to all people all the time, you're just going to spin your wheels. You're going to get burned out. And so it's irritating when you try to you know, cater to this family or this, their personal preference, but then this other family or person, their, their pet project is something different. And, and, and as pastors, we find that our agenda is torn in so many directions, and it's not just focused on, on loving people and teaching the word like 
keeping it simple like the Bible seems to make it. Sometimes churches are more about programs than people. And then pastors, we take it personally when people leave because our church's particular brand of ministry doesn't live up to some kind of unrealistic or unmet expectation. So it's no wonder then that in an attempt to overcome that, many pastors, many church leaders turn to various cookie cutter church growth programs. All, all the mega churches, almost all their pastors have written books that say, if you just do this and be like me, then you also will have 20,000 people in worship and a water park on your church campus. Oh, but the disclaimer is, but individual results will, will vary. And so I get at least an email every day talking about, you know, five ways to grow to your church or 10 ways to close the, the back door. And sometimes it seems like churches are constantly just rebranding themselves depending on what ministry conference or leadership book the pastor just happened to read that weekend. And they trot out a new mission statement every month and the pastor and the church board are regularly announcing the new direction where God is leading them and sometimes the new direction is the opposite direction of last week and so you know we feel like we're moving like this and like dancing the robot or something and so no matter the denomination whether you are Lutheran or Baptist or Pentecostal or Methodist all these programs promise different ways to be the church. You can be a purpose-driven church. You can be a simple church. You can be a sticky church. You can be an authentic church, a relevant church, an emerging church, a confessional church. And if you really want to be a happening place, why not just throw out all your theology and traditions? Because maybe you don't even need to talk about Jesus or sin. I don't want to name names. I don't want to say, but uh, the pastor of the largest church in America, I heard him once say on an interview on 60 Minutes that he doesn't feel like he needs to talk a lot about Jesus and his messages and his sermons. He doesn't need to talk a lot about sin because his job is just to help people have a better life. Maybe he's more like a, a life coach or a personal guru than a minister of the word. Because after all, pastors are also tempted to be people pleasers. And the highest law of consumerism is what? Give the people what they want. Danger. <laughs> well timed. In the consumer culture of 21st century America, Church and ministry have become more about marketing and showmanship than about discipleship. And so a lot of pastors and church leaders in various denominations, they, they have this now, this, this kind of go against the grain of that, right? Let's get back to basics. Let's get back to what the church is supposed to be about. And sometimes you'll hear them use kind of this catchphrase of let's get back to Acts 2. Have you ever heard that? Let's be more like an Acts to church. And, and people might say, well, what, what's meant by all that? We hear that in our lesson today. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Wow. Does this picture of the early church in Jerusalem amaze you? It amazes me. I mean, the people were excited. To hear the word of God, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. The Greek word there means that they, they were gripping very strongly, holding very firmly onto the apostles' teaching. It's almost like, you know, you, you, you cannot pry this Bible from my hand. And they shared their life together, both inside and outside of worship. It talks about how they gathered in the temple and they gathered in their homes. Because fellowship is not just chit-chatting over coffee and donuts after church. 
fellowship is koinonia. It's, it's shared life. It's life together in Christ, not just at church, but at home, at work, at school, wherever believers are. And the early disciples were regular at the Lord's Supper. It says that they broke bread daily in their homes. Daily. And they devoted themselves also to prayer. And what's more, there was not a single needy person among them because they willingly sold everything that they had and held all of their property in common. Their solution to poverty was not food drives and clothes closets and government programs. It was just to take care of each other, to sell their earthly possessions and pool their resources. Now, I know that that one is going to go over like a lead balloon in Douglas County. <laughs> you all ready to sell everything you have and, and bring it in and, and put it in a pool? You know, I've heard people talk about this as being Christian communism, but that's not a good label for it because, first of all, communism is atheistic. And also, communism is compulsory. It's where the state takes away the property from everybody. But this was voluntary. They willingly, joyfully gave what they had, sold it, and brought it out of sheer joy of loving Jesus. And what was the remarkable way, the remarkable result of this way of doing ministry? Well, it was growth. Luke tells us that the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They had daily conversions to the Christian faith. And in the verse right before our reading, we even hear about how 3,000 people were added to their number in one day. The Acts 2 church loved the Lord. They loved the Word. They loved each other, and they loved people that didn't know Jesus yet. And, and they just grew and grew. So forget about purpose-driven church, sticky church, simple church, whatever. This is the answer, right? Acts 2. Acts 2 is the perfect church. And if we could just gather for Bible study and the Lord's Supper every day, and if we would have dinner in each other's homes every day, and if we would sell everything we have and bring it and, and, and put it right in the middle of the floor here at the church, then it would be perfect, right? And Epiphany would just grow and grow and grow, and we would beat out all the competition. I, I mean the other churches on the team. And we would be the best church in Castle Rock, right? Right? That's what we got to do. Acts 2 all the way. No. Despite this idyllic description, the early church in Jerusalem was anything but perfect. And when you read on in the book of Acts, you see that bear out. The end of Acts chapter 4 gives us another little repeat about how, how they had every, all their property in common. And it talks about people selling all their homes and all their houses uh, their land and, and, and giving it uh, at the apostles' feet. It talks about the great unity they had. Um, they definitely uh, were not Toyota people because they were all of one accord. Um, so they were, they were, yeah, I know. I only have bad jokes, okay? It only gets worse. But at the same time that all these people are selling their property and bringing it to church, there was one couple that didn't like this whole prayer care share setup. They didn't like the idea of selling everything they had and giving it to the church. They went by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And when they sold their house, they kept some of the proceeds for themselves. Now, there's nothing, nothing intrinsically wrong about doing that. Good Christian people sell property and buy property all the time and keep the proceeds for themselves. There's nothing that said that they had to do this, except that they boasted that they were. They told people that they were going to give all the proceeds to the church, and then they kept some back. And so they lied to Pastor Pete, the Apostle Peter, and they cheated on their stewardship commitment card. And what did God do to them? He punished them. He struck them dead right then and there. And Luke writes, and great fear came upon the whole church. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's got to be one of the biggest understatements in Scripture, right? The whole church was afraid when those guys dropped dead for lying when they gave their offering. 
And why do you think they were afraid? Because Ananias and Sapphira probably weren't the only ones that were cheating on what they gave. And then you get to Acts chapter 6, and you find out that there was prejudice in the church. There was discrimination that was causing problems. In the earliest days of Christianity, nearly all believers were Jewish. Probably 99.9% of all of the first Christians were Jewish. But that didn't mean that all of them spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, the languages of the Old Testament, because many of them had become very secularized, and the language that they spoke at home was the language of the marketplace. It was the Greek language of, of the peoples that had conquered them. And these Greek-speaking Jews, they were called Hellenists. I don't know if you know, but Helen is the Greek word for Greek. So if you know a woman named Helen, her name means Greek. And so she's Greek even if she says she's German because she's Helen. Um, But when that daily food distribution happened, the Greek-speaking Jewish widows in the church were left out. They didn't get their fair share. And so there was conflict, and this whole enterprise of pooling everything and sharing equitably wasn't working. Not until the apostles appointed seven deacons to help make sure that the Greek-speaking widows got theirs. But the racist attitudes in the church were not stamped out just like that. Things got even more complicated when Peter and Paul started preaching not just to Greek-speaking Jews, but actual Greeks. Actual Romans, non-Jews that are called Gentiles, they dressed differently, they walked differently, they had different customs, they ate foods that were forbidden by the Old Testament, and this disgusted the Jewish Christians. They insisted that before these Gentiles, these Greek and Roman believers, were baptized and welcomed into the church, first they had to be circumcised and become Jews. Now, I don't know, gentlemen, but... If somebody came to you and said, you know, at, you know, 25, 35, 85, before you join Epiphany, you got to get circumcised first. (laughs) Sign me up! (laughs) No, not until the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 did this issue get settled. And so you can see that the Acts 2 church was anything but perfect. And just like the American church, they had to deal with conflicts, misunderstandings, disappointments, false teaching, getting behind in the budget. And why was that? Well, I know it's going to shock you. It's going to shock you to hear that the church in Jerusalem that was led by the 12 apostles of Jesus was full of sinners. Can you believe that? There were sinners in that church. Because the Christian church is not a museum of saints. It's a field hospital for sinners. And as St. Paul himself writes, here is a trustworthy saying deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. The King James Version said, of whom I am chief. Paul called himself the chief of sinners. And that's where we get that hymn. Chief of sinners, though I be... Jesus shed his blood for me. And I know that this is really going to rock your world. But did you know that even here at Epiphany, we have a church full of sinners? And even more devastating, you have a pastor who is a sinner. I am the foremost sinner, the chief sinner, the top sinner in this place. Because there's no perfect church on earth. There's no perfect church in Castle Rock or Colorado or anywhere in the world. There's no perfect pastor either. I know you think I come pretty close, but... (laughs) No. The only perfect church is the church in heaven. And the only perfect pastor is Jesus. Jesus, the good shepherd. That's the good news, that Jesus is the perfect pastor. Um, Pastor, the word pastor, it's the Latin word for shepherd. Did you know that? So when we say Jesus is the good shepherd, we're saying he's the good pastor. In our reading from 1 Peter, we heard that he's the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. Jesus is the pastor, 
the bishop of our souls, and he has promised to build his church. A good reminder that it's not your church or my church or the Missouri Synod's church. It's Jesus' church, the bride that he bought with blood when he poured out his life on the cross and rose again. And because of Jesus' death on the cross and because of his great love for the church, he doesn't see us as conflicted or confused or beyond hope or behind budget. He sees us as beautiful. He sees us as full of splendor, without spot or wrinkle, holy, without blemish. Jesus will build his church because he loves the church. And Jesus loves you. And notice that that's exactly what Luke tells us in our lesson from Acts. The apostles did not build the church. Jesus built that church. Jesus made it grow. It says in verse 47, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The Lord grew the church because that's what Jesus does. He saves people. He saves you and me and those first disciples and, and those weird Greeks and Romans. And he still saves people today. And how does he do it? He does it through the means of grace. He does it through the word and through the sacraments. That's what the church was all about. That's what the church has always been about, is receiving and believing in the gifts that God gives us through Jesus. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The people of God gather in prayer and fellowship around God's word. That's what it means to hold to the apostles' teaching. And around the Lord's Supper, that's what is meant by the breaking of the bread, that we eat and we drink and we hear what Jesus wants to give us. We receive that. We believe that. And Jesus saves people through that, and the church grows. And it's not a perfect process. And it's not always day by day, every day, new people are converted and added to the church. And it's not always going to be 3,000 in one day. But every time that somebody comes and is baptized, whether they're a baby, a child, or an adult, every time that the word is preached or taught in Sunday school and Bible class and people hear it and believe it, every time we come to the table and receive Jesus' body and blood, Miracles are happening. Faith is created. Faith is strengthened. Sins are forgiven. And the church grows. It's not a perfect church. Not until we get to heaven. Or really probably better said, not until the new heaven comes to us when Jesus comes back. And we don't have a, we don't have a, a, a perfect preacher <laughs> at any of the churches. We don't have a perfect pastor other than Jesus. Jesus, the good shepherd. Jesus, the good pastor who laid down his life for the sheep so that they could have life abundant in him. He is the good pastor, the one who died, the one who rose again for you. Jesus is the good pastor who knows your name. And he is why we gather. He's the one that we need. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.